Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. In this session we create AG cluster listener. Then we quickly learn how connectivity works in this AG listener and deeply understand settings like multi subnet failover, register all IP providers and host record TTL. In this session we concentrate on virtual network name which we call VNN. If you want to know about distributed network names that is DNN, you can refer to my next session. This session will definitely help you while troubleshooting connection issues related to AG cluster listener. First, we will understand connectivity in single subnet case. Then we will switch to multi subnet case. Afterwards, we will troubleshoot one interesting sample case where connection latency happens. Let's get started. Let's first create our working environment. I have four VMs here. One is domain controller. Second one is primary replica. Third one is secondary replica in the same subnet. Then I have another secondary replica in another subnet. First, I create Windows failover cluster by including primary and secondary replicas. Please note that you should not include domain controller here. After creating the cluster, you can confirm the nodes here. Now, after Windows cluster, let's create SQL Server Availability Group cluster. For this, we go to SSMS and expand Availability Group object. We initiate the wizard. By adding all the single subnet VMs, I create single subnet AG cluster. After creating the cluster, I create a listener. My port number is default 1433 and listener IP is 10.0.0.12. Then I go to client machine and make connection to this listener from the client. As you can see, connection is succeeding. Let's understand how this connectivity is working in the background. We created the cluster with the two servers in the same subnet. Compared to secondary server, listener IP is attached to primary server as secondary IP. Let's see how client connects now. This is a client. When it initiates connection, it firstly makes DNS request for this listener DNS name. Then, this server initially does not know which server owns this listener IP. Therefore, it makes IRP request to all the servers. Primary server quickly responds with its MAC address. In this way, client knows who is primary server and makes connection to this server. Now, suppose failover happened and secondary became primary. In this case, secondary IP is moved to secondary server. As a result, connection to this first primary server starts to fail with TCP retransmissions and reset as secondary IP does not exist anymore, right? After a few retries, client gives up and makes IRP request again. In this case, client gets response from new primary and makes connection. In this way, failover is detected. Let's see this in action. First, let's check IP setting. I go to primary and run IP config. As you can see here, we have primary IP and secondary IP. The secondary IP is listener IP. This is exactly what we talked about. Let's also check the same from the secondary replica. As you can see, in secondary replica, there is no secondary IP. Then we go to client. Here, I use this filter in Wireshark to track the connection traces. I'm filtering all ARP, DNS and other listener IP address. Before tracking, I clear all the ARP and DNS cache so that we can see all the traces. Then I start Wireshark tracing and make connection to database. You can see traces have been generated. First, DNS query. This is DNS response. You can see DNS server is providing listener IP for this listener DNS name, okay? Next step is becoming to find who has this listener IP. As you can see, primary server is sharing its MAC address and saying like, I have this IP, send packet to me. Then client is sending packet to this primary server. Now let's initiate failover. We go to primary and do failover. Let's check what happened to the connection at this timing. 
As you can see, existing connections has be, have been closed with reset. A new ARP request is made. After that, client is finding that this time listener IP has been moved to another server and connection to new primary is being established. This is what exactly what we talked about, right? This is how failure happens in listener and this is how client detects failure. Let's now switch to multi-subnet case. First, I create multi-subnet AG cluster and a listener quickly. I launch availability group wizard. Name this cluster as AG multiple subnet. This time, I add replica located in another subnet. Then I create AG. Let's now create listener. As you can see, listener in multi-subnet multi case has two IP addresses attached for each subnet. This is a difference between multi-subnet and single subnet case. Our listener is ready. If we check failover class manager, we can see that listener IP in primary server is online, while the other in secondary is offline. I'll explain why this is designed like that. Let's now try to connect to this listener. Our connection is succeeding. Let's now learn how this connection is happening in multi-subnet in the background. This is different from single subnet and very much interesting. In this case of multi-subnet, both primary and secondary servers are attached secondary IPs. But secondary IP in the secondary server is always offline. We already saw that, right? Let's see how clients make connection in this case. When client makes request to the listener, the same way it first queries the DNS server for listener domain name. In this case, DNS response depends on the setting called register all providers IP. If this setting equal to zero, only one primary server's IP is registered for this listener DNS name and DNS response contains only one IP. If this setting equal to one, both secondary and primary IPs are registered for the DNS name. You can check this setting by running the following command in primary server. As you can see, this setting equal to one in my case, which means two IPs are registered for the listener DNS name. We can easily check this with resolve DNS name command in PowerShell. As you can see, two IPs are registered. Let's first see the case when register all providers IP equal to one when there are two IPs. So in this case, when a client makes connection, there are two IPs. Client does not know who is primary and who is secondary. In this case, another parameter, multi-subnet failover, comes into play. If client adds this parameter in connection string, connections are made to all the registered IPs in parallel. The connection to primary is established, while connection to secondary does not happen. It might sometimes fail with rate transmits or client does not receive any response from secondary. In this way, primary is identified and connection to primary is established. If failover happens, secondary IP in old primary is taken offline and in new server made online. As parallel connections are being made, client is able to quickly detect who became primary. Let's see this in action. As you can see, currently 101 is primary. Let's go to client and track traces with this filter. As you can see, I'm checking both IP addresses of listener. I clear all DNS and ARP caches. Then I specify multi-subnet failover to true in the connection stream. Start traces and make connection to multi-subnet listener. This is DNS query. If we check the DNS response, we can see that DNS response contains two IPs for the listener DNS name because we specified register all IP providers to 21, right? Then, as you can see, parallel request is being made to both of these IPs. 
because we specified multi subnet failover to true and response from primary repl replica is coming back as IP is online only in this primary. What about response from secondary? Let's check. As you can see, there is no any response from secondary. Sometimes you might see retransmits in this case, depending on your network setting. For example, if there is no firewall, retransmits and resets might be triggered by secondary. Let's do failover. After failover, we reconnect. As you can see, this time, response is coming back from new primary service IP, which is online now, right? This is how failover happens in multi-subnet environment. Parallel request is very much important. Therefore, as also stated in Microsoft documentation, you should always specify multi-subnet failover to true in client connection string when multiple IPs are registered to listener IP. This makes failover process faster as clients quickly identifies who is primary with parallel connections. If you do not specify multi-subnet over to true, for example, the connection becomes sequential. The client randomly makes request to one of the registered IPs. If connection is made firstly to secondary IP by mistake, connection fails and the client makes several retries and makes connection to another server sequentially. In this way, you might experience connection latency and connection failures. Multi-subnet parameter is comparatively new parameter and might not be supported in legacy applications. In this case, you don't have another choice other than setting register all IP providers equal to zero, which means only one IP should be registered for listener DNS name. How client connects in, the, in this case? Client makes connection only to primary after getting DNS response. There is no any parallel connections. In this case, another setting, host record TTL, comes into play. This is DNS cache time to leave. If host record TTL equal to 300, client will continue making requests for 300 seconds even after failover. In this case, retransmissions might happen and client experience connection failures. Only after 300 seconds, client makes DNS request again and then it understands new IP and makes request to new primary. Therefore, this 300 seconds can be considered as latency. Let's troubleshoot one case related to this issue. In this case, I reproduce the issue where failover latency happens. As you can see, currently register all providers IP equal to 1 and host record TTL equal to 1200 seconds. Let's now change register all providers IP to 0. After running this, restarting the role, we can see that only one primary service IP has been registered. Let's now make connection to this primary server from client and track it. I flushed all DNS and uh, ARP, ARP uh, caches. I make request. As you can see, DNS response in this case contains only one IP and we are making request to this IP. Let me show you the latency issue. I do failover and as you can see, online IP changed. Let me reconnect. Now latency started and we are not being able to connect. When we check traces, we can see retransmits because client is still continuing to reset the request to old IP, which is already offline after failover. Client is not recognizing failover because we are not doing any parallel request, right? This issue will continue until DNS cache is updated. In this case, we can just run flush DNS. After flushing DNS cache, you can see that we are, we are able to connect again because client requested DNS again, okay? And understood that failure happened and now it should make request to another server. 
By changing this host record TTL, we can decrease DNS cache TTL. Let's make it now, all it's 60 seconds. Furthermore, we change DNS cache setting in DNS server. Make cache TTL to all these 10 seconds. After this, let's do failover and reproduce the issue again and try to reconnect. Now, without flashing any DNS, we wait for 60 seconds. Now, we are being able to connect. As you can see, DNS cache is defined latency in AG cluster failover. This is very much important. This was old way of connecting and failover setting. Nowadays, Microsoft always recommends updating your application and setting register all IP providers to one and using multi subnet failover to true for faster connection uh, for faster connection after failover. As you can see, right, this might uh, latency might be issue with old old drivers and old applications. I hope you found this session useful. Do not forget to share and subscribe for more interesting videos. Thank you.